Moving ahead quickly to our next panel on warehouse the strategic center of new supply chain. I would like to call upon the panelist Padmini Pagatala, sales head, consumer and pharmaceuticals at Mahindra Logistics. Shrikant Bancheshwaran, vice president and head planning and logistics and commodity all buying, Godrej Consumer Products. Alok Bansal, chief executive officer, Bill My Infra. Vivek Rathi, director research, Knight Frank. Arif Siddiqui, founder and director at Point Consulting. I would once again go to the audience and request you to type in your questions and will be taken post panel. This panel along with question answers will be of one hour as we are running late and I would request Arif to kindly take up the discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much um, and um, uh, thanks to ISCM uh, to, for putting up this uh, very nice uh, symposium together and I welcome all the uh, panelists on this uh, panel. As we're running short in time, I think I will uh, quickly get into the uh, the discussion. Uh, I can see that probably Shrikant, Shrikant is, uh, is Shrikant available here? Oh, yes, I can hear you clear. Can you put your video on, please, Shrikant? Hi. Uh, I have attempted to. Uh, seems to have a problem. OK. Fine, so we will live with your audio. Uh, we'll manage with the audio, yeah. Uh, okay, so uh, I think with the introduction having done, uh, this uh, is going to be a very interesting uh, panel for discussion because we're going to uh, deep dive into uh, the, the changing and the, uh, the evolution of the warehouse uh, to becoming uh, the epicenter of supply chain strategy. Uh, I think this is, uh, this is going to be very interesting. Uh, but as far as the uh, brief uh, session intro is concerned, that while companies are actually preparing uh, contingency plans for uh, production, uh, continued supply and logistics services to deal uh, with this <laughs> the crisis now appears to be disrupting global supply chain for a very long time. Uh, we've seen a lot of disruption in the past two and a half uh, months. And I think this disruption is something like, like COVID is here to stay. Disruption will continue for some more time. And this is where it's going to make a difference between the boy and the men, uh, where uh, we will have to be very agile. We will have to be extremely responsive in our actions in managing our warehouses and overall supply chain. While the production related challenges can uh, actually be overcome in the, in the coming months, uh, there's limited inbound and outbound freight capacities could also become a big obstacle in supply chain normalization. Uh, uh, in this panel, to help supply chain managers uh, address the situation and initiate risk mitigation plans, companies must actually prepare uh, for uh, all the activities that we need to do uh, to ensure that um, you know, we are ready even in the short as well as in the medium term. I wish to actually uh, share that up until uh, say about March 2020, the long-term drivers uh, were economic drivers were actually start, had started yielding results. It's the streamlining, the infrastructure classification, and the push by the industry, growth of e-commerce, draft of the national logistics policy, the India India becoming a global supply chain hub, reach and FDI in the infrastructure and logistics park development sector. Uh, and, and various such policies started, actually, we had started seeing the settling down of these policies. And they were slowly, you know, leading to some economic results. But the pandemic led to factors which disrupted the warehouse and warehousing industry. And the reality we now face when we walk out after the unlocking uh, is uh, the migration of all the skilled labors we've been talking about in the skilled hands, which were trained over the past several years. Vanishing of the demand in several industry sectors, global supply chain disruption, uh, leading to new methods of doing business. Well, there have been a lucky few of us here in terms of the pharma industry, the healthcare, the FMCG, and the food, and I'm sure there are quite a few others, but many have been a very, very, very unlucky for the past two and a half years. The factual condition remains that over about $175 billion worth of annual imports and exports are linked to high-impacted COVID nations like the United States, UK, 
and Europe. Indian pharma depends over 70% by value on Chinese imports. This is also a fact. But the scenario during the pandemic is FMCG, e-commerce and 3PL essentials, pharma, agri, cold storages, etc. They have seen a growth during this pandemic. Retail, manufacturing, non-essential e-commerce, auto and others have seen a degrowth. Post-pandemic, the probability of warehouse demand recovery speed will be very quick on 3PLs, e-commerce, FMCG or essential goods and services and pharma. However, my opinion would be that, that moderate to slow recovery will take place on the auto, high value consumer goods, non-essential, oil and gas sectors, etc. as space requirements to, growth, uh, to grow in medium term will be a little sluggish. However, let's, uh, uh, let's look at what, what could happen probably to industrial recovery. India is likely to remain resilient, in my opinion, on making India programs. Pharma, electric, electronics, textiles could mark stronger presence uh, in export, in the export exchequer as compared to the past. But demand for industrial facilities from growing manufacturing sectors are expected to remain unshaken in the long run. So gentlemen, um, with all this in the background and the backdrop, uh, this session will discuss what type of uh, resets are going to take place, uh, strategic changes and implications for the sector, will, we will try to spend some time to understand from this August uh, panel, uh, their views and their insights, and the operating implications that lie ahead uh, will also be discussed. With this, I open the panel for discussion, and with the first question that I have here uh, with me, I would like to start with Srikant. Srikant, what are the resets on the warehouse demand side that you see that's going to take place going forward now? Uh, hi, Arif. Uh, uh, firstly, thanks to the uh, the forum for inviting me to uh, uh, this uh, panel. Uh, I represent uh, an FMCG organization, uh, and uh, uh, I would consider myself to be a part of uh, uh, the organization, which is which is lucky at this point of time. Uh, we've seen good good growths happening uh, in the consumer environment, where the demands have been robust. Uh, and the real struggle has been towards getting supplies uh, into the market, uh, which actually means that a lot of our warehouses at this point of time are underutilized. So uh, the warehouse spaces, as we see across the country, are significantly underutilized. Uh, and we see that that not changing for a good amount of time. Uh, significant increase in production is where we would be able to come anywhere close to a good warehouse utilization. And unfortunately, the, the old process that we followed uh, in terms of scaling of warehouses over a couple of uh, years, trying to estimate warehouse requirements on an annualized basis with different quarters and, and stuff like that, uh, don't seem to exist anymore. So currently, uh, we're actually stuck with some of our contracts uh, where we don't really have a great demand for warehouse space, uh, but we really can't get rid of it. Uh, I believe the other spectrum would also be there for a lot of industries where you've stuck with a lot of material which is not moving out. So I think it's a mix of both. Uh, on one set of industries which are kind of uh, you know struggling to uh, get good with the production rates where the warehouse utilization has been low. And on the other side where there's a demand uh, issue that's coming up, the warehouse uh, utilizations have been high. So I think it, it's about time where in about in the next quarter, uh, uh, we see it stabilizing a bit more. Uh, and overall, uh, by by end of this uh, Q2 uh, of our financial year, I believe we would we would obviously be more stable with our demand. Uh, we would also uh, be able to get more clear with what's the kind of capacity. So. Uh, the 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 rule of thumb would be that we store more inventory at this point of time uh, because disruptions can happen at any time at any warehouse point. Uh, so the rule of thumb is to increase the inventory in the system and move away from the traditional piece. So going forward, I guess uh, the warehouse utilizations would improve. But as of now, it's a mixed bag. Uh, some guys 
or have under utilization the other ones are over utilizing the space not able to hear uh, you couldn't hear me clear uh, no no i'm sorry yeah. i was yeah. uh, uh, I said that's the, that that's a very pragmatic and a very realistic uh, uh, answer, and uh, I completely agree that uh, probably Q2 is going to see uh, the real scenario as it dwells, or rather as it develops. You know, uh, Vivek, uh, uh, coming to you uh, from uh, the overall study of the industry and the research that probably Knight Frank uh, has has quite well been doing and presenting. What is your view? How would this? How would the warehouse demand shape up? I mean, overall, uh, as as we now turn on uh, to an unlocking scenario and business will start getting slowly back to usual, uh, how do you see this, you know, the demand of warehouse uh, coming up? Yeah, uh, thanks, Arif, and thanks to the ISCM forum. Uh, so, in you know, so I come from Knight Frank, and you know we are international property consultants. So by that virtue, we are present across the entire real estate spectrum, which is residential, office, retail, and warehousing. And now, uh, you know, warehousing is something which is kind of gaining greater and greater prominence in all our conversations that we have internally as well as externally. So, in terms of what happens now given this pandemic and all the disturbance which is created now you know to start with we have you know, see in terms of the current state of affairs the biggest unknown today is the timeline for which this coronavirus will stay and while there is no final word in terms of the timeline of this coronavirus but certainly this economic situation and the change in consumption pattern is certainly going to reflect on warehousing demand as well. So in the short to medium term, maybe a year to three years, it will have an impact. So if you just go back last couple of years, we've seen a very strong demand for the warehousing segment. But in, so demand growth of annual growth of 60 to 65% for the last three years. But this year it is likely to be impacted in terms of occupier group, uh, you know, so the way we look at it in terms of the occupier group, uh, you know, uh, the way we look at it, it is going to be a mixed bag. So the most, the sectors which have been impacted during the lockdown because by the virtue of not being an essential service, and even after the lockdown is lifted, some of these segments which are either credit dependent, heavily credit dependent, like an automobile or, you know, construction related, uh, and therefore going to be having a tough business environment. So from these segments like auto and auto ancillary or engineering, electricals, the demand for warehousing space is going to shrink. But on the other hand, e-commerce, FMCG, 3PL are segments which are expected to enhance their footprint. So uh, uh, close to a 40 million square feet is the kind of warehousing demand that we expect amongst these top city top eight cities and out of which about say 40 to 45 percent coming from uh, uh, 3pl segment and 20 22 percent coming from e-commerce segment and the remaining you know to be amongst the fmcg fmcd retail and uh, other manufacturing segments so certainly there is going to be an impact in terms of the warehousing demand overall, but it is going to be a mixed bag depending on which sectors are going to be relatively resilient compared to the others. Great, I think uh, the last piece that you shared was really, uh, you know, a very insightful and, and very research oriented. And as you said that uh, out of 40 million that comes out of these top eight cities, uh, 40% uh, or 30% between 30% cargo comes from 3PL and 22% through the FMCG. And these are two areas where you see uh, that there could be some sort of sustainability in terms of the demand. However, the other segments look a little more conservative uh, to you. Uh, you know, I think uh, good insight, uh, uh, Alok, now I'll come to you um, uh, as an organization uh, you have an experience overall in, in turnkey projects uh, of building warehouses. Uh, can I just uh, ask you that um, 
uh, obviously, depending on the improvement or the increase in demand of warehouse infrastructure, your business is quite related to that. Fine. Uh, how gung ho are you uh, on on the fact that uh, this demand is going to be looking upwards? You know, the the graph will look upwards with, with despite all the things that have been talked about in terms of industrial slow growth, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Right. So. Arun, my question is very direct because before this infrastructure tanki, I was with three real companies. My background is this. I always believe in three-four principle. That is, till the time India becomes developed, e-commerce has to grow, logistic has to grow, infrastructure has to grow. And after getting the infrastructure status to the logistic and supply chain, this has to grow. So this is number one. This is quite strong. Number two, if you see the growth now of our e-commerce companies because we are competing with China, so e-commerce companies, especially in grocery, food, Walmart. Go first, big basket. They are the perfect example that their wages are doubling up, and they are doing the consolidation right now because we are working with one of these companies, and they are having around six to seven warehouses in North India, and now they are closing two to the facilities because this is a containment zone, and they are consolidating the space. Most of the companies are coming as they are dependent or you know consultants, uh, consulting companies like you, uh, uh, builders or uh, infrastructure people like us uh, or the three tier people to operate and to get the efficiency in terms of scaling. So this is a very important piece. So next two to three months, because every every software for demand forecasting has been failed because nobody is judging the market. We cannot. But after two months, we would have the direct clarity. And I'm really I am very hopeful that you know the warehousing market is the most resilient one, and it will continue growing. I was I was looking after uh, I was uh, taking a gist of from a couple of reports. So one report is saying around three million square feet has been closed in the last six months around six cities. Around three million, uh, three million dollars. I mean, I know uh, kept for a couple of big logistic parks. Uh, FDA is also coming. Yes, uh, investors are wary right now, but investments are coming. So we see that now uh, more compliant facilities, more project-oriented facilities, more program facilities will be coming up. People are dependent on providers, suppliers, uh, people, people, companies like us who can develop these facilities, they can give to especially FMCG companies, e-commerce companies because they have to cater the demand. Demand is increasing. People are at home, so they are also dependent on e-commerce company to supply as fast as possible. And and similarly, uh, uh, e-commerce companies are dependent on the suppliers of people like us and us and you. And if I talk about what are being the the what are being the major research as you the, as uh, you through the first question to one of the panelists. So I think before after GST, we were thinking consolidations. I have think from a smaller warehouses to big warehouses. Now I see from consolidations to fragmentation are also happening because people are thinking if my warehouse is at containment zone and it will be there in the six or eight months, you, you probably don't know that was the future. So better to have multiple warehouses rather than one warehouse. So again, it will increase the demand of warehousing. Number two, e-commerce we have to supply as as fast as possible. Especially in grocery and for grocery, you cannot wait for three four more days. So they have to be near to the space. So a smaller facilities, multi-layered facilities will be coming up. And I think this is a fantastic opportunity for us. Yes, after two months, it would be. And next two months, there's some confusion. Some, some, okay. some of the lowest part of us. Yeah, I think, I think uh, uh, your view is also quite uh, important and quite valid. I would say that yes, valid from that point of view, that yes, uh, there is going to be uh, we can see an increase in demand as far as you know tier two and tier three cities are concerned because there would be a lot of regionalization that could probably take place. I mean, we will probably talk about this, uh, you know, uh, go vocal and uh, the the other strategy of make in India uh, is going to be uh, there'll be more stress on such strategies by and policies by the government uh, and which is going to be important and that's going to create a lot of geographical change, you know, in the way. Uh, we look at warehousing in probably the B and the C class uh, cities. Uh, uh, I think that's that's important. Uh, uh, Shri, I'd like to just come back once again to you. You know, uh, Shikant. Um, in terms of research, on yes, please go ahead. Uh, I'm saying, in terms of resetting on infrastructure and facilities, what's your take? Do you see infrastructure and facilities reset in that area being, again, taking place? Post uh, so yes, there's clearly a need uh, for a reset of sorts uh, in infrastructure. 
uh, primarily arising out of two changes that have happened uh, in this COVID environment. Uh, and let me briefly touch on both of them. The first one uh, is the need uh, for the unskilled labor and the labor migration that's happened in a lot of our warehouses. So uh, we definitely see a lot of migrant labor issue and hence the need for some form of reset that's happening uh, towards the way we use uh, automation tools uh, and you know kind of reduce the overall labor dependence uh, on our on our uh, warehouses the second piece is is the piece even around the unskilled uh, or the skilled labors so uh, what we realize is there's still a churn happening uh, in the in the uh, kind of skilled labor as well which means for maintaining better controls uh, it's important that we have a uh, greater uh, techniques or softwares to kind of uh, uh, you know maintain control from a central space uh, uh, for our warehouse network so uh, both in terms of uh, a churn in the skilled labor and a reduction in the unskilled labor it's essential that we kind of reset uh, and kind of use better technology to be more scalable over a period of time so uh, uh, and also I, I see consolidation of warehouses uh, uh, a thing that uh, would not happen too much uh, very similar to what mr bansel said so there is a risk of uh, a, a, a warehouse going into a containment zone uh, so uh, we've also seen that uh, a warehouses in a say a rural space uh, tends to be less affected uh, with the administrative restrictions uh, so a lot of resets as to where would you want to place these warehouses what are the kind of tools and techniques that you would want to kind of reduce your dependence both on skilled and unskilled labor is something that we would want to quickly do. okay great uh, and uh, vivek uh, your take on infrastructure facilities resetting uh, do you see the infrastructure facilities resetting and what type of resets are going to take place uh, see i think the debate around infrastructure one is in terms of the quality of infrastructure for the warehouse and the facilities which has kind of uh, kind of seen a shift since gst came in and we saw you know in terms of uh, you know quality of flooring the height insulation all those things now the debate around infrastructure and facilities is more towards business continuity and uh, what can ensure what are the factors which to be put in place can ensure that I can continue with my you know, business with, with my supply chain and my warehouse being the critical component of that business. And on that account, uh, we see, you know, in terms of institutional space, uh, institutional space has been, has responded well in terms of ensuring business continuity and which is why you know we see in terms of infrastructure and facilities even from the supply side uh, bigger and bigger developers and institutions of you know global repute have you know come into the space and the difference ha is reflecting in terms of the co you know uh, continuity support that they provided even during these lockdown uh, which happened over the last three months uh, while most of these warehouses are outside of you know urban centers or municipal corporations so in terms of the lockdown it will be relatively relaxed compared to say in city warehouses but then you never know that again you know some of these lockdowns will come again so you need a warehouse partner which is which which can ensure who can ensure a, you know a continuity even in the times of crisis we saw these we saw this across segments whether it is office space uh, or retail space uh, retail spaces are completely not allowed by the government but even in case of office uh, buildings uh, and that is what is being extended to warehouse spaces as well that institutional spaces have responded better uh, in terms of ensuring business continuity and that is where you know there will be a lot of uh, attention uh, beyond grade a and grade b debates yeah, I completely agree with you. Actually, in the previous session, uh, there was this discussion in terms of uh, how quick will organizations bounce back in case of such uh, instant lockdowns and instant uh, scenarios where the whole, the whole paradigm shift takes place. And the importance is going to be speed, 
it's going to be with less people you want better productivity and so and so forth and when you want better productivity and you want alacrity and agility in your in your processes then the design of these infrastructures design of layouts the layouts of of warehouses and layouts of of distributions and fulfillment centers actually come in the forefront you know uh, of actually clearing all these uh, all this through and that is where in, recently i was talking to uh, to one of my clients and he, he said that uh, i wish i would have shifted into a better warehouse and i wish i would have shifted into a better laid out warehouse you know rather than just being stuck here because as a pharma organization we have so much to deliver but we are facing huge problems and bottlenecks and so and so forth because of either scarcity of space or i don't have the storage systems etc etc so yes i think that is definitely one reset that's going to take place where people have become cognizant of the fact that they need to organize themselves a little better to be able to act fast you know because speed is going to be uh, a very very important uh, aspect now let me come to uh, uh, to padmini uh, padmini she's been very patiently listening to all the all the things that have been spoken uh, waiting for a turn uh, uh, padmini uh, as much as we talked about the reset on warehouse demand the reset on warehouse geography and uh, infrastructure and facility i think there's one very important reset that i uh, i think we all see in the same with the same eye you know is going to be the reset on automation and technology what's your take on that uh thank you arif uh, can you hear me okay right. well so thank you uh, arif um this is automation and tech is one of my favorite topics uh today i work for a 3pl company but uh, i have a predominant experience working with large automated facilities coming from an e-commerce background of course uh right so um automation is a giant i believe that um, this is an area where uh, the warehouses are going to be reset and the most immediate reset i believe is going to happen in uh, this bracket that you talked about automation and tech and uh, while i say that it might be a bit of a shocker to you but let me explain right now automation um is is valid for very distinct reasons if you have the volumes if you're an asian paints if you're a coca cola yes automation does make sense to you or if you're a flip cart sorting 5000 units per hour right but largely otherwise if you're talking about an asrs or if you're talking about robots moving around in your warehouse um automation is like a six six pack we all want to have six packs right but how many of us are willing to invest the time in it or in this case invest the dollars in it right so jokes apart um automation is important we all need to be aware of it but that's in the future what's more important within this bracket of automation and tech is systems that is much more immediate i know today warehouses run uh, with no wms warehouse management systems right we have uh, inventory management software being substituted used as a wms right and the span of systems is infinite we have warehouse management systems we have a uh, labor management system i mean it, it's a big ocean that is out there right so the first place that all of us should go is uh, do you have batch control do you have the ability to flow through stuff without putting away can you pick it and send it out right um i'll give you another example esogam many everybody must be familiar with esogam in karnataka if you have shipments more than 20000 rupees you have to file esogam online so imagine uh, in flipkart there is a day that uh, we have uh, an iphone sale what happens we have six computers on the dock all the computers are blocked right everybody is keying an esogam for each individual shipment right of course eventually we automated this process and uh, it could get keyed in and the forms would be generated so this is the sort of technology that i'm talking about that we need to invest in first uh, before we go ahead and think about other things and this needs to happen very quickly is is what i believe right and uh, another uh, concept that we need to talk about in this um, bracket of automation and technology is sortation sortation is becoming much more affordable um, i think even medium volumes with medium uh, companies with medium volumes will also yeah. want to look at sortation not to save the cost of workforce this is more to probably uh, reduce uh, square footage that you need in a warehouse and improve accuracy and uh, luckily for us um, 
these kinds of technologies and systems are becoming much more affordable i remember when i started my career a put to light sortation system would cost around 120000 us because you had to buy it as a package even if you only had 30 lights right that's no longer the case uh, systems we have a lot of uh, players in india who have uh, their systems so i will recommend that everybody uh, look at uh, systems, be it warehouse management system, labor management system, automating processes. Do you know where your truck is? Do you know when the truck is going to reach uh, the other warehouse? Or even to the point of uh, being able to give your driver a phone and say, if you have a puncture, just go, go into this app and, and tap on this, right? Yes, automation, we all need to be aware about it, about the ASRSs, about uh, robots running around in warehouses, uh, a butler system many of you must have heard about it but that's the final frontier right now most immediately get your systems in place is what i would recommend very good excellent insight i think that's a very very again it's a very pragmatic approach uh, to things and for sure if we don't have basic digitization of processes uh, then most of our automation full-fledged automation will also not give you the that's best right. result because right. they run on w WES systems, and this is a WMS, and they're constantly talking to each other. Mm -hmm. They have to keep talking to each other without having the digital system, which is your processes running through a software or through a system, like warehouse management system for that matter, or a transport management system. And there's no sense and there's no point in moving up uh, onto automation. I completely uh, buy what you say and agree that yes, that's uh, uh, one way. Uh, I just wanted to uh, warn uh, uh, everybody that we are running a little behind uh, behind time. We're supposed to keep two minutes as our talk time on on uh, on each of the questions. Uh, I will uh, uh, I will uh, skip the uh, automation part uh, with Alok, which is I think uh, supposed to be one question that I had to ask him. Let me just quickly get to the the strategic. <laughs> And, and the implications, the strategic changes and implications. So now my question is going to uh, start uh, from Alok, and I would like to ask Alok, you know, uh, what do you think uh, that post-pandemic or as we open up now, what are going to be some of the key strategic changes and the implication of these changes that organizations are going to take? So what are going to be the key strategic changes that organizations will have to talk and think and probably implement and what would be the implication of such changes? Alok. Your, uh, your mic is off. Yeah, I'm sorry. So if I talk about implication of changes, which major organization would like to take, and when I talk about warehousing industry, then obviously, as Vivek mentioned, e-commerce and logistics are the big, 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 big. big. So how real, because mostly as a 3PL people or these companies, they have to be cost conscious also, they have to be technology driven also, they have to maintain the value, the scaling and the efficiency and the execution. So as I said, number one point is that, you know, if I, till today I was talking about having higher, bigger warehouses, now I have to think about the fragmentation of warehouses. So I have to bring about all my people, my placement of technologies, expenditures, and everything talent around these warehouses because if i have to maintain several facilities then planning should be different planning should be more robust second is now companies have to think before before they were working on jid model now jid cannot work because they we have seen the examples in last last two to three months so mostly companies they have to pile up these stocks so from jid moving to piling up these stocks so again there's a change in shape of thinking of planning execution technologies money many other factors and suppose if I'm I'm filling my one warehouse with a lot of inventory and suddenly, you know, there's different shape of the coin in next two months and what would happen. So a lot of risk management has also to be done. And, you know, fast moving inventory should be at the periphery of the cities where two, three cities are connected rather than having a warehouse in one city. So that city is locked, you cannot move out. So there are some of the planning we have to do. And third, uh, third, I would say that only channel because now companies as, as they are seeing that you know people are uh, sitting at home they are being comfort comfortable position to order online everything so now company has to shift their strategy from only offline to omni channel when i was talking to many many uh, decision makers last one to two weeks so i have got from everybody is planning about omni channel every everybody is planning about the you know better movement of their labor and and also, yes, one of the very important points, and you know, now people are also thinking 
to have the proper movement and living space for labor because they were struggling with the labor so now they are making these spaces in their warehouses they are making shelter homes when they were not taking care of the labor so now this is the radical shift in the thinking now we have to keep, uh, take care of the of our labor because if labor is not there if people are not there we cannot run the warehouses okay so if time is Good. less so i would like to put myself here yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for outlining uh, some of your thoughts as far as strategy is concerned. And I think most of them, what you said, are all valid and uh, have been reiterated in various sessions. I completely agree with you. Let me quickly uh, move on to Shrikant. Uh, Shrikant, uh, do you see a probable shift from the present lean supply chain concept uh, to ideal inventory levels, which are resulting in companies to reassess uh, optimum in inventory levels and inventory levels and volumes? and business continuity plans that could translate to greater demand. Do you see this shift taking place from lean supply chain to ideal inventory levels? Your, your views on this. So yes, uh, RFI, thanks. Uh, I think on inventory levels, uh, traditionally our inventory levels by first principle have depended on uh, two things. One is the supply side variability, the second is the demand side variability. Uh, so on the supply side, I think, uh, the whole environment is uh, so, uh, you know, uh, changing uh, with changes in transit times, uh, placement of vehicles being an issue at times, and even productivity from factory changing from one place to another. Uh, so the supply side variability has gone up. And there's always a risk of uh, one of our units, you know, kind of stopping for a few days. Uh, so there's obviously a shift from being lean to be able to, you know, reach out to a market need at a time when it comes uh, now the demand side variability also is very interesting so gone are the times where uh, we just competed with two or three large players now it's a it's a battle in a in a very regional space so i don't battle with the top two uh, manufacturers in in say the in the state of gujarat and it's not the same in the state of andhra pradesh so you know the the competition also keeps varying so my market share today is a function of not just my availability, but also a specific competition player being in or out of the market. And in this COVID environment, I see that uh, it's, it's very random. So you would find a specific player being out of market just because there was an incidence at their factory. So our ability to meet the market need is going to happen if I have the inventory. So I think gone are the times where lean inventory was something that we lived with. Uh, now, Inventory is our ability to reach out to the customer when there is a potential sale. So obviously we are trying to get to the right inventory levels. At the same time, obsolescence is something that all of us are very wary about. Uh, it will not go beyond the point, but we are definitely going to catch up for what is going to happen to reduce the supply variability and to take opportunity uh, when there is a demand uh, issue with say our competition at a specific space. Great. I think very well said, very well put, very, very important points. I think uh, this would really benefit uh, most of our audience. Uh, Vivek, uh, on the same question, uh, lean supply chain, which has been a very popular, I would say, adoption in many organizations and especially in the distribution side uh, versus uh, ideal inventory levels. Many companies recently have faced this huge issue of not having enough stocks uh, when they were actually needed. You know, and you may, you may remember for a very long time, shelves were empty. The first maybe six to eight weeks of this lockdown, we found that shelves were virtually empty. And it took almost six to eight weeks of time for large organizations, huge brands to actually come back and bounce back with some sort of, so that means they were caught unaware. And probably because there was very, very, there was, there was immense amount of leanness in their, in, in, in their inventory. Your take on lean versus ideal inventory? Yeah, yeah. In fact, true, Arif, and you know, when I am myself faced as a, uh, you know, as a consumer, how you know, so many stockouts for you know at multiple uh, point of sales. So, which is the case? But as Srikanth indicated, uh, demand side variability was always there. This was the time uh, during the last three months when we saw so much supply side variability. And with the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, you know, there, 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 in terms of the entire supply chain, 
uh, there were places of production where you know uh, there was no lockdown in between in the interim warehouses had you know locked down or were operating or you know the point of sales were operating but then the warehouses were disrupted so all of this has given a good kind of uh, food for thought in terms of inventory levels changing but as i see it besides the you know demand and supply side variability uh, whether it is the element of carrying cost or other cost related issues will define the uh, longer term strategy so for the moment yes uh, organizations would in would like to have you know a higher inventory level uh, but and that may you know lead to a greater space but then that greater space for warehousing as well i i think you know can be will be utilized by going more vert vertical or kind of utilizing the un uh, otherwise unutilized uh, cubic space rather than adding more square footage in terms of your warehousing so should be should be you know in in the medium term yes you know people would want to kind of have a higher inventory level but in terms of the long term the other thoughts around you know carrying cost of inventory and uh, variability are the ones demand variability are the ones which are going to define at the same time i also think in terms of higher inventory levels uh, people would want to kind of uh, spread their risk by moving to smaller cities like your ludhiana coimbatore guwahati or siliguri which will kind of see a greater warehousing demand uh, by the virtue of uh, you know having more you know a higher level of inventory uh, at different places okay so your your take is that you would see that people would probably try to mitigate the entire risk by spreading the inventory across to smaller locations and probably use that also as an opportunity to improve their service levels at the same time carry inventory so that it can be it can be shifted uh, uh, later on from one place to the other that's what i probably understand you're trying to say am i right yeah yeah that's right okay fine padmini quickly uh, uh, the same question to you so real quick uh, whatever uh, vivek and shrikant said yes not just in india globally we are moving from just in time to a just in case strategy right manufacturing even manufacturing is being split across countries that's what we are seeing globally um as supply chain folks none of us can go back to our ceos and say okay we need to increase the safety stock that means our supply chain cost is going to go up by 15% you know none of us can really say that so what i think should happen is in the event that uh, safety stock is going to increase we need to try to reduce the um, fluctuations of inventory what i mean by this is it's very typical in consumer business that the last week consumes about 40% is out of the door that's that's usually typical um, and this typically comes from people like me sales people who make most of their sales towards the end of the month so we need to come up with trying to uh, define what a month is for different sales people maybe that might be a way so that even though inventory is going to increase on one side we don't have this massive outflow of uh, throughput from just that week 4 or week 3 depending on your company right so this is one way we can mitigate it and avoid what is going to be a, a reality avoid the cost increase from what is going to be a reality okay good that's a completely different insight you know i think uh, absolutely i agree that when you look at snop the fluctuation between forecast and real demand uh, most of the gap comes because we have great sales people forecasting that they're going to do pretty well and then finally you end up having only that much you know so i think uh, that's those gaps continue to exist and we need to address them uh, uh, i quickly come to shrikant uh, shrikant going forward uh, will large fmcg companies consider strategic tie ups with last mile delivery companies in the recent in the recent scenario we saw that last mile uh became most critical and you would find that uh, you know there were these bikers and and small vehicle owners you know driving all around the place dropping shipments to gates etc etc uh, do you think it's ringing a bell in the minds of of companies like yours and and other fmcg companies to actually have some sort of strategic tie up with uh last mile last mile delivery companies oh uh, yes arif so uh, i think lockdowns uh, kind of leapfrog Uh, our change from uh, the traditional distribution model to a direct to retail or a direct to consumer piece by at least a couple of years so uh, we would not have done what we've done right now at least for two more years so 
Uh, if you look at if you look at the e-com business for most FMCGs, so and I speak for the FMCGs. Uh, if it's at five percent, it's a huge chunk that's already happening. Uh, most of us are in the band of one to two or three percent of our sales coming from the e-com channel per se. Uh, the the DTC, which is direct to consumer, uh, which is the e-com piece that we are uh, talking of right now, uh, has actually grown a lot because of the lockdown that we see right now. Uh, but we still believe it, it's quite a, a time uh, that it will take before the e-com actually grows large. Uh, but the strategic tie-ups with these players is going to be a thing uh, that we're going to look forward to, uh, not just in the space of the bikers and reaching directly to the consumers, uh, but even in the space of reaching directly to retailers at time. So there are a lot of direct-to-retail models that are opening up at this point of time. Uh, that's also because of the uncertainty. So the first uh, month or so showed up that a lot of distributors actually could not open. Uh, and, and we had just no choice but to reach out to the retailers uh, directly if we wanted to have the sale going. So uh, I think a lot of things that have happened in the last two months uh, are something which, which, which have leapfrogged our need to tie up with these guys. Uh, and that's going to help us. I'm sure it's going to help us. But I don't know if it's going to sustain this, the rate that we've seen in the last two months we might see the traditional model also growing at this point of time. So the Kirana stores have actually been the biggest support at this point of time. So the direct to retail might be something that might stay for longer and have a big impact. The direct to consumer is growing and it's growing 2x, 3x. I mean, the growths are phenomenal. But will that make a difference to an organization like us? Uh, over a period of time, yes, but it, it's not a big change. Thank you very much. That's uh, very, very, very vital inputs. Uh, Vivek, uh, what will be uh, the implication on uh, warehouse space and uh, 3PL operations demand uh, if production linked incentives are given to attract companies in manufacturing sector? Uh, is this becoming a reality in India? Do you really see this? Happening? So, I think, you know, in terms of the incentives for production, so there, the most re the recent debate about you know manufacturing movement out of china and you know some of you know the intent uh, some uh, the the beneficiaries in terms of you know which countries would benefit therefore that the verdict is not out yet but yes you know if, even if we consider with the right set of production linked incentives even you know among the five six countries which are the contenders even if india captures uh, a part of it the opportunity is huge so manufacturing sector has a big contribution in terms of the warehousing potential now if that happens what could be the likely possible impact on warehousing demand or warehousing profile so some of these uh, you know industrial facing clusters like say chakan talegaon in pune or say hoskot nilmangla in bangalore and these are the kind of markets which will see you know a, a higher shift in demand uh, because of you know the nature of uh, the nature of warehousing ecosystem provided there even in terms of design and quality and specification it will kind of have more than storage so you know maybe whether it is light assembly or high value add high, uh, activities which generally these manufacturing related manufacturing phases occupiers want to utilize okay so, so obviously, yes, I completely agree that as if manufacturing uh, improves or other grows from that point of view, definitely warehousing will grow. And the moment warehousing grows, so 3PL opportunities will also grow. However, I think a, a, a case in point uh, mentioned in the previous uh, session is that third party logistics companies will have to actually position themselves as specialists if they really want to get extra business or value added business from so from from principal companies otherwise it will continue to remain a commoditized service if you don't add value the service will remain commoditized you will not get your extra value for it extra buck for it and you will just remain within the the cost reimbursement you know paradigm that's where we will continue to remain unless you are seen as specialists and people who will be able to do things differently and i think that's that will continue to remain a huge challenge to third party service providers or, uh, or contract logistics uh, service uh, providers. Uh, with that, uh, having stated that, Padmini, I'll come to you since you represent a 3PL company. Uh, are there major learnings with respect to 
contract terms and conditions between principals and free peers. Uh, recently, I have been told by several uh, of my free peer friends, you know, uh, who, and that that they've had some sort of uh, discussions going on, hard talk going on between uh, principal companies and three PL companies, especially with respect to discount on rent, uh, discount on on contractual agreements, discount on not paying for this. It's been a contract holiday, this, that, and all that, and a lot of money seems to have got stuck in this the cash flow issues that companies are facing. Uh, uh, what would you? What is your learning from this? Do you think that the there are certain uh, we've learned about certain loopholes in the contract which need to be probably strengthened or do you feel that there is uh, an issue of some attitude temperament that needs to be worked out or ironed out uh this is a great question are actually in a very very relevant one for the times uh this question reminds me of a quote that uh, warren buffet has said so he said uh, only when the tide goes out you can see who's swimming naked what he meant by this is uh, in a good economy when the cash is flowing you don't get to go and uh, look at every little process with a microscope right only when the economy goes down or a situation like covid has hit uh, we all go and look at every little process within the company using a microscope be it contractual terms uh, be it um, are you billing on time i would say not just 3pl companies any companies uh, i think most of us have had to do it in the last couple of months are we billing on time if the customer has a query are we addressing this within time if the payment terms is going to be 30 days when are we actually getting paid so um, this has been a revelation i would think not just for a 3pl company for most companies when i talk to people uh, the cash flow cycle has become uh, prime and uh, that that's a universal truth i believe and it is not just we've learned so many things in this lockdown and uh, i don't think it's going to go away once uh, covid stops and i hope covid goes away pretty soon but even then whatever the good things that we have learned i think we need to to hang on to them uh, it's possible that contracts have done the right way but uh, translating that to reality is something that all of us have got back in the last couple of months and and had a check at so yeah, I think that's that's a universal thing that we've all learned. Uh, thank you. I won't dwell too much on that because I'm sure some of your customers are listening also. At this exactly, stage. you yeah. got it right. <laughs> <laughs> so I can appreciate that you've been very very diplomatic in the, uh, exactly. on that I'll front. Exactly. I try to be as smooth about it as possible. Especially, I can feel Shaykhan's eyes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I understand. But I think I just I took the lead to just take out this question yeah. because I mm -hmm. appreciate it. It is a, it is hard times. Yeah. Alok, um, yes. Alok, do you see do you see that uh, there's going to be an increase in demand of quality warehouse specifically that will be able to help deliver uh, productivity and efficiency in a in, yes, in B and C, and C class cities? Correct. I personally see it will because there are very very valid reasons. A lot of corridors are coming, a lot of manufacturing hubs are coming, a lot of foreign companies are coming and they're shifting from China, Korea to us. Those six countries are competing to get this business. So if I see the optimum scenario, if we get the one sixth of the business also, then also most of the companies will be coming to India and we have to cater to them. Our facility should be compliance oriented. Our facility should be quality oriented. Our facility, our facility should be giving uh, that much comfort to them so that they can Think to scale multiple facilities in future rather than you know only sticking to one or two and then uh, going uh, for the alternatives. So when I talk about the quality, then you know I have seen a lot of warehouses where internal roads are not mapped, water drainage system is not there. We cannot call them warehouses for FMCG companies. We call we cannot call them warehouses for international uh, companies. So we have to make them as good as they are. Sufficient high compound wall should be there. Environment sustainability solution should be there. Sophisticated fire hydrant systems are not there. This is very painful to see. Lot of warehouses are there in, in cities like Gurgaon, you know, Mumbai, where uh, facilities are not fire compliant, and that is the major major need. So this should be there. So definitely, it is a demand that you know we need to have better better facilities. Then only we can expect better client because if if better clients are coming, you can expect longer agreements. So now negotiation would be also who is the permanent client for the next 20 years or 25 years 
rather than giving the warehouse to a three three years client or five years client these are the negotiation number two if facilities are better you can have the better renters and then you can you can uh, you know play with the opex quite uh, with agility so these are the things and for need i think uh, uh, demand for good consultants good providers good builders would be increasing especially in dr2 cities because landlords have lands they do not have knowledge base they do not have a right uh, thinking to make this so they, they need somebody to to make them better so i think this is going to be increased for sure thank you thank you very much i think you made a i couldn't agree more uh, and this is exactly what we've been trying to do for the past 15 years to design better to better and better facilities to do better and better intra warehouse designs and we have come a very long way in the past 15 years and i'm sure you know this will propagate i think the core here is whenever even i speak to developers you know they say we are willing to make a warehouse which is not only best in class best in the world okay but i need a customer to pay me for it okay right so yes. i think there is one thing if we expect the moon then you need a rocket to reach to the moon you can't right. walk it to the moon so you need to pay the rocket fee to go to the moon otherwise don't expect the moon and today the ecosystem remains where it is i mean all these all these 5 billion dollar investment etc that we talked about is only it's only creating an inventory of hardly 5% of the total logistic warehousing space in the country so all these big names are only going to create space which is equivalent to not more than 4 to 5% of what warehousing space is actually required in the country 95% of the warehousing space is actually d e f g h quality i don't know what to call it z quality you know the point the point is that if the demand the consumers don't demand you know and are not willing to pay for what they demand then we will continue to we won't walk the talk we will just continue to be more hypothetical than realistic so i think uh, this is uh, to all the people who are listening i think it's for them that uh, we they need, to, they need to ask for and be willing to pay for what they ask for that's very important developers are there to develop they will develop i don't see any any issue no everybody wants to have a great great facility uh, with this uh, we come to the last tranche of our uh, uh, of uh, of our session uh, in this last tranche we're going to uh, spend some time uh, uh, discussing and learning about the operations implications uh, that would now take place in the new uh, in the new normal scenario okay uh, so with this uh, i will directly come to shrikant uh, here shrikant uh, do you see more and more warehouses likely uh, to mechanize in terms of material handling automate automation process in terms of basic automation and i'm not talking of high end uh, automation uh, uh, and do you see warehouses and distribution centers adopting technology i mean what type of of change in handling do you see that organizations are going to do in order to adopt and rather evolve as automated mechanized and technology driven uh, distribution centers uh, so again are if uh, automation comes at a cost uh, and and there has to be a, a need to it so uh, traditionally the warehouse throughputs were never a problem for uh, case pack uh, kind of operators and players like us who could who could probably do what 50 trucks a day and be comfortable about it so uh, throughputs have never been a major challenge uh, and and hence we've not really invested a lot in material handling uh, uh i would not call it automation uh, material handling ease so you always had uh, uh, pallet movers which were there uh, and that to uh, manual pallet movers uh, you had loaders into the the place but you didn't have conveyors so you didn't have conveyors which would take it from deep into the warehouse into the truck you didn't have uh, stackers uh, and, and you really didn't use the volume space in the warehouse as well so there are two two basic pieces which are going to you know force us to do this material handling better first is just the lack of labor and, and i see that happening in specific pockets uh, it's not an all india phenomenon uh, we've seen that west india is really struggling so we know bhivandi is struggling we know pune is struggling we know ahmedabad is struggling uh, and in these pockets you're not going to get labor who is going to come every day and you know kind of uh, do it so we want to upscale the labor and kind of make it easier for them to operate 
So a material handling would definitely be a space that we would work there. Second is the whole piece around inventory. So as we attempt to increase our inventory in the same warehouse, I'm sure we're not going to get budgets to kind of increase our uh, square feet space. So it's the cubic space that we would want to do and that would need a uh, better material handling. And lastly, obviously, it's not just the unskilled labor which is moving out. As I mentioned, we also have a churn in the skilled labor uh, set as well, which means this whole dependence on supervisors to kind of manually know, pick, place is not going to happen anymore. So the WMSs are going to be an essential minimum. Uh, the TMSs for tracking trucks to locations are going to be an essential minimum. So I think uh, very simple tracking solutions, very simple WMS uh, solutions for uh, you know pick and place. Uh, these are going to be definitely an essential systems change and simple material handling automation. So I'm not talking of uh, you know hunky dory uh, stuff, uh, something that an Amazon or a Flipkart will require, but very simple conveyors, uh, cart pullers. Uh, you know, forklifts. So those are kind of things that are going to change for sure. Good point. I think uh, as far as there's a change, uh, one change will lead to the other and the other will lead to the other. You know, uh, the fact that uh, you say, see that, mechan and I call it as mechanization. So yes, mechanization uh, is here uh, to have happened and also will continue to happen. Maybe this time it's going to be very, very fast. And those who are already mechanized will probably look at other options of automation. From mechanization will go up the ladder and jump up the ladder to, to automation. And, and that's a very positive sign. So that's something which will, uh, in any case, it's, it's a move towards modernization of the warehouses. And then we have them uh, moving and uh, probably things will speed up. Uh, Vivek, what's your take on the same, on, on this huge discussion on automation and mechanization? I think I have similar thoughts as you know even Srikant indicated so mechanization yes automation yes but in terms of technology I have my doubts in the Indian context so uh, not not to say that you know Indian warehouses and in in facility activities are devoid of technology but then in its presence is minimum and you know here again in India in terms of my exposure I've seen you know e-commerce segment uh being at the forefront of technology adoption and as far as their supply chain operations are considered simply because of the virtue of the you know, large number of sku's that they handle but here again globally what e-commerce enterprises have been uh, adopting in terms of technology is completely at a different scale so whether it is internet of things or augmented reality or you know robotics and uh, you know uh, self driving machines so those are the things which are very relevant to the European and American markets considering the cost and technology are uh, cost of labor and technology uh, you know uh, price but when it comes to the Indian context I think this arbitrage between labor and the cost of technology will be a very big factor and that is going to decide over the medium to long term how much of technology adoption uh, takes shape even in segments beyond e-commerce. So, you know, uh, in terms of the COVID-19 uh, situation, yes, there has been an impact in terms of labor availability. Um, we, you know, one is sure how long will this, uh, you know, sustain. Uh, we've also seen some of these responses like, you know, DGCA uh, gave special permission to some of these e-commerce companies to test and use drones for deliveries until, you know, uh, September of this year. So some of these initiatives are being, you know, uh, adopted and experimented on the technology side, but on a larger scale and, you know, um, beyond the beyond the uncertainties created by this uh, COVID-19 scenario, it is going to be a function of, you know, um, cost and cost of uh, technology versus the default option. Okay, uh, great. Uh, much as I may agree with you, but uh, I, my, my, my two takes on this would also be, you know, that as sizes of shipments get more and more fragmented, you know, and become more and more smaller. And we move from cases to pieces and pieces to eaches, okay? I think uh, handling technology, sortation technology, et cetera, will become more and more essential, 
especially also when you move from uh, from uh, a brick and mortar to not only e-commerce but to hyper local where smaller packs are going to be convenient available in convenience stores in community stores and so on and so forth i think the the aspect of smaller volumes will and handling the complexity of handling much smaller cases and smaller pieces is by itself going to create the demand for uh, for small picks, small sortation systems, etc., which I'm sure are not going to be becoming too expensive. I think today most of the automation in India is only expensive because there isn't enough scale available. You know, once scale is available, then uh, then even uh, the butler could be could be very much, I would say, affordable from that point of view. But scale needs to be available from that point of view. Alok, uh, your point quickly in one minute, if yeah. you can if you can say your point in exactly one minute. My, my point is there are some basic basic confusion when we talk about automation everybody start thinking about robots and many many big machines which is yeah. not the need so first of all companies and they need to understand what is the need when we talk about automation it is not only robots the software have some basic wms some basic oms tms then you can have hsts rfids this only you can bring and you can have you know good efficiencies then you can have you know conveyor belts or some material handling equipment and then you move to other things this is point number one point number two if i talk about on the major scale that is middle scale so if i talk about wuhan that is the epicenter of that apartment so when lockdown was most of the companies were running at 80 percent of their previous capacity because they were uh, they were already automated so this is the importance of automation so those who can bring the automation they should because in future we need that consumer you know uh, supply supply demand cycle to be maintained and second you know i would also suggest because i have seen many manufacturing companies they they have ksrs they have other systems but they are not they are not having the basic predictive analysis so they have to urge upon machine learning and analysis so that the production could become better rather than you know investing a lot so this is the basic uh, understanding of automation i would say we should be clear yeah. what we need yeah, I think I go back to what Srikant was saying, you know, that uh, I can clearly see Western India and uh, part of Northern India to be really su suffering with the fact that a lot of migrant population has actually moved out. These migrant population, it took them, it took, it took people like us, all of us here, you know, worked in warehouses, you know, it has taken us more than 10 years to 15 years to train these guys how to efficiently and proactively run uh, drive forklifts to to operate sortation systems to operate uh, you know use scanners and start scanning stuff etc and they were they became pretty fast on these things 50 percent or 60 yes. percent of these people have vanished they've vanished in thin air okay and it's going to take us days before we they come back or probably they don't come back and or, or, or for us to even train new uh, new hands it's going to take days to that now, such scenarios, if these such scenarios keep happening and you have your, you operate with 50% labor, then you have no other choice but to start taking those small steps to the big word of automation. And, I'm, and I completely agree. We are not talking of AGVs and robotics and, and it's not even talking about, for example, ASRSs to that extent. But small mini load stuff, you know, things which can do sortations, things that can replace a human being carrying a box on his head from a point a to point b at least getting the getting into that culture you know into that small culture to start taking that one baby step ahead you know uh, is something which i think human beings will learn and 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 i think necessity is the mother of of invention uh, and uh, the necessity has probably now it has come it's knocking on the doors uh, let me come to uh, padmini and uh, now we would like to reduce our answer time to about one minute and 15 seconds because uh, I'm being uh, sent messages to to keep a watch on time. I have a timer, uh, but, actually. I look at it. Yeah. <laughs> Very good. Padmini, uh, which of the warehouse performance metrics do you see will remain affected for a long time? I'm not sure how many people are actually even using warehouse performance metrics, but for the, for the benefit of people who are actually having warehouse performance metrics in place and are measuring OTIF, you know, uh, uh, yeah. and so and so forth, or default or so and so forth. Fine. Which of them do you think will remain affected? The question is affected for a long time. And what should be done to keep the performance and service levels high? Uh, 
despite all the obstacles we've spoken about. Right. So I'll keep my answer really short. Uh, it's it's pretty obvious. Productivity is going to be hit on all fronts, uh, and as a consequence of its OTIP, right? But I, when I really think about it, uh, there's a metric that stacked in e-commerce companies: dock to stock time and stock to dock time. Basically, if it is on your receiving dock, how much time before it becomes active inventory, and likewise, uh, if, if an order is placed, when is it out on the uh, staged on the outbound dock, right? So these two metrics, I believe, are going to be impacted. And uh, my answer, I stick to my earlier answer, the way that most of these met matrices can be improved and uh, maintained at higher levels is invest in systems. That's what I would say. Everything needs to start becoming visible to you, whether you're in uh, uh, USA, you're in your own house in Bombay, whatever it may be. So yeah, I think that was like uh, 30 seconds, yeah. 40 seconds. <laughs> so it was fine. It was. I think you. You. Regardless of the time, you actually stated what you wanted to state, and I. I completely <laughs> appreciate that. Uh, let me just remain with you for the next question. You know, uh, which type of companies and industry sectors do you think will embark on B two C, on the B two C channel, uh, taking on online orders and e commerce uh, route? You know, per se. I'm not saying that which are the online companies that are that will develop, but I'm saying which companies we've been in the brick, brick and mortar. Uh, business or have been using other channels of distribution, conventional channels of distribution, will now get into B2C. I mean, which, where do you see it happening? Ready made garments, pharma, where, I mean, which sector? So I, I, this question is great. I love it. And we've all been asking ourselves this question for the last uh, five years, right? So, in short, all. But if I have to really uh, think about it and say which is going to be number one is going to be fashion, obviously, apparel, the shoes, the makeup. All the stores are not going to stock all the sizes, uh, and uh, most of this forum is men. When it comes to makeup, there are shades and stuff. You know, all the stores are not going to be able to do that, right? But the second sector, which is of the greatest interest to me and for a lot of people on this panel, must be the FMCG companies. This is my my personal belief. Um, this is going to go online. Not it's it's not going to be elitist people ordering stuff uh, online, right? If if you look at TikTok, TikTok is a phenomenon. It's much more popular in rural India than it is in urban India. You know, people who just have a smartphone are making so many TikTok videos. So e-commerce from consumer, uh, today what the consumer companies are missing is how many times did a person come in and ask for rent, but was given an aerial, right? Uh, they know that it's stocked out, but they don't know how many people walked in and asked, asked for that particular brand X, Y, Z. So it is going to give data and it is going to give access to this very large market and it can't come at a premium cost it is going to be that like a, like an amazon prime like a netflix you subscribe to fmcg company xyz all your needs for this year you get 10 percent off right so that's the way i personally think uh, that uh, these consumer companies are going to be big on the bandwagon i know already a lot of consumer companies don't think of other consumer companies as competition they look at flipkart and amazon as competition right so this is going to be a, a, a big bang as consumers it's going to be great for us uh, and it's going to change the way we make purchases and i would say again the bedrock for e-commerce again is system system systems there you go Arun. great good good yes uh, shrikant uh, in your opinion uh, do you agree that there has been there is a, a, a scarcity of drivers and labors actually? Uh, so yes, uh, I think uh, more than so. What we see right now is actually the demand not actually having caught up to the full. So we're very very close to uh, half of the demand probably. A lot of sectors are just coming up in the month of June. So the driver scarcity has actually not hit us uh, very badly. Uh, what's hitting us badly in long haul is actually the return load. So we really don't have the secondary freights and stuff. But the driver scarcity has not hit us. Uh, I think it will it will be a problem coming into Q2. Uh, Q2 would also be a problem about vehicles itself. So you have these bank moratoriums and stuff which is happening right now. Uh, you might see trucks going off roads uh, uh, probably in Q2. So with demand kind of catching up significantly, uh, almost all sectors so only essential was on in the q1 q2 would see a lot of pent up demand there will be mobile phones garments everything kind of catching up uh, for demand the supply is going to not catch up at the same pace both in terms of drivers and trucks 
Okay, good. Um, unfortunately, I I will have to stop here uh, due to the paucity of time. Uh, but let me just let me just ask each one of you in one word, only one word. Okay, which of the following is more likely with respect to increase in price? Which of the following is most likely in terms of increase in price? Increase in rentals of warehouses, increase in price of warehousing as a service, that means a 3PL service, okay, and increase in last mile delivery. Alok, one word. I think uh, all, the, all will increase, but also depends okay. which locality geography. Vivek. I would say last mile delivery. Admini. Warehousing as a service. As a service. You yeah. would like it to increase. Of course. Okay. <laughs> yes, and I would not want it to increase. So, but last mile is what <laughs> I think. Uh, <laughs> Okay, I think we got our answers here. Thank you very much. It was phenomenal. I should say thank you very much for your very, very candid uh, responses. I'm sure our audience is going to is going to be extremely beneficial. You know, they wanted they wanted people to be very frank. Uh, I have time. I've been uh, I've been given about uh, four five minutes to quickly answer question uh, uh, to to ask you questions. Jessel, uh, 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 I'm sorry if we can take the questions post uh, offline, please. We are running short okay, of time, and we need to run for the next panel. So what I'm going to do, what I'm going to do is that I have got some uh, 15 questions or 10 to 12 questions here, which has uh, which have been received from various participants and attendees. Uh, I will uh, ask uh, ISCM to consolidate yes. these questions and send them to all of us to this group, and we can answer them, and they can be sent back to the respective uh, audience and attendees. Okay. Thank you very much uh, for your time. Uh, grateful. Uh, thanks, thank you, Arif. Bye, each one of you. Bye-bye. Thank, thank you, Dr. Rakesh. Thank you, Arif. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, all the panelists. Thank you very much. Okay. Bye.